Um, I'm going to hand it off to Michael, um, and we won't feel only that he has to compliment, but um, add his own insights before we go to questions. Thanks very much, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at WOLA, and thanks very much for the invitation. I look forward to all your questions during the Q&A session. I'm going to divide my remarks up today by talking a little bit about how I see the crisis uh, affecting Chavismo and the government in power, more in terms of uh, recent and current events in Venezuela, less in terms of the broader background that David discussed. I want to touch then quickly on the elections and what we know so far about these elections in comparison to the 2010 parliamentary elections. And then I want to talk about the state of play within the opposition. And last, I'd like to talk about the international scene. And I think I have a different view about the geopolitical trends emerging right now than David. So I think it's important to realize that Maduro came to office in a political crisis. Um, between the October 2012 elections that Hugo Chavez won and the elections that Nicolas Maduro won in April 2013, Chavismo leaked 700,000 votes to the opposition. After that, Maduro still faced serious, continued to face serious questions about his power, his influence within the government. Fast forwarding today, on top of the fact that he never put these political problems behind him, Maduro now faces a full-blown economic crisis. So what am I taking away from recent events in Venezuela, where we have discussion of a president uh, with an approval rating of 22%, with really serious economic troubles, perhaps worse than the government is willing to admit, or own up to, uh, in terms of uh, skyrocketing inflation. Um, the, the dollar on the black market today traded at 200 bolivares, which is an important psychological barrier to go over. Um, and then yeah, I think we have this recent crackdown on the opposition, which I think is that's, that's what it should be called in a lot of ways. Um, so I see a government that is nervous, is a bit unsure of itself, and has taken a radical line. Frankly, I think this radical line is first and foremost a provocation. It's an incitement to the opposition to fall into the trap of looking for a quick fix, and then for the government to foil that and play the role of victim. At the same time, this radical turn, I think, is also an attempt to change the public discussion. Um, Chavismo's own coalition at the level of elites and at the level of popular sectors is suffering, I think, um, from some major stresses. At the elite level, you have the emergence of, I think, real uh, dissident Chavismo factions in the form of a group called Socialist Tide, a uh, recent open letter from a former foreign min pardon me, a, far a former finance minister of the uh, Chavez government was very, very forceful, um, considering the letter went so far as to defend Antonio Ledesma and say that he was not Cooster. Uh, but the biggest problem that Maduro faces is, is the threat of a social crisis. That is, he sort of got through the political crisis, he's dealing with economic crisis, are we going to see a social one? Between 2012 and 2013, Poverty by income jumped from 25% to 32%, with extreme poverty going from 7 to 10. And that's according to national government statistics, as reported by CEPOL. At the same time, I do not see a major withdrawal of state institutions from popular sector arenas. So I think there still exists some downgraded form of a social safety net out there. So comparing this moment of economic pressure with the 1990s, I don't see yet a major rupture between state and society, which led to this sort of sense of um, resentment and disenchantment with the political system uh, more broadly. But at the same time, things are very far from calm. We had the tragic death yesterday of a 14-year-old in Tachira, died at, um, at, at their a uh, member of the National Police Forces, rubber bullets from a shotgun. Um, th and this is an example of how unrest could easily snowball into conflict. Um, the government's reaction of admitting responsibility and jailing one of these, the police, one of the police officers potentially responsible is, I think, a further sign that is feeling some heat from this pressure. So still early in this year, in this 2015, which is shaping up as a very difficult year. Turning to the parliamentary elections, though we do not have a date yet for them, in which these parliamentary elections, which will involve uh, all, 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 all parliamentarians will be up, right? It's not just half of the Senate or half of the House like it is in, in, in our elections. And Venezuela has a unicameral system, it's important to recognize. Um, but we already do, knew, do know some things about the pre-campaign period of this electoral process. Specifically, the scheduling of the election. We don't have a date yet. 
Uh, in, for example, with the 2010 elections, um, those were the date for the elections was announced November 4, 2009. That was 11 months before the actual elections took place. Uh, if the CNE were to announce the date of the elections next week, uh, and the elections were to be held presumably, like some people suggest, in December, that would be a lead time of potentially nine months. So we're already looking at a, a, a you know, different timeline along those lines. Uh, the CNE has announced that it's going to support uh, primaries within the opposition and uh, those held by the uh, Socialist Party of Venezuela, the, the pro-government party. Uh, those primaries will take place first for the opposition the third week of May and those for the government uh, in later in June. Um, the big question, though, that people are talking about in Caracas is electoral districting. Um, in 2010, the National Electoral Board announced changed boundaries for electoral districts in 13 states. The boundaries of those were announced in January 2010, nine month lapse between that time period for the redistricting and the elections. Um, so the talk of the town now is, is the CNE going to do more redistricting and will it be politically biased? Most people think it will be if it does, play, play, if it does take place. One of the electoral processes underway at the moment is voter registration. Uh, the CNE opens up these mobile voter, voter registration centers where it goes throughout the country and invites people to, you know, get a cedula, their national identity card, and be registered to vote in the upcoming elections. Um, if the opposition was better organized at the moment, which is something I'll say, uh, I'll talk about in a second, I think that it would have been able to get what are called in Venezuela testigos, witnesses, out to these sites to be able to participate um, in this process and, and bear witness to the fact that these voters were in fact being registered under the proper conditions and in the right fashion and so on and so forth like this. Um, th this is a problem so far because the opposition is complaining about these, the, the voter registration process so far. Um, also important to remember about Venezuelan elections is that in 2009 the electoral law was reformed. That reform uh, diminished the importance of proportional representation in the Venezuelan system. Um, alongside redrawn electoral districts, this had important consequences. For example, in those 2010 elections, the government party, PESUV, um, won 1% 1 more of the vote than uh, candidates affiliated with the Democratic Unity Table, the MOOD, 47 to 46. But pro-government candidates under the PESUV party won 20% more of the representation. They won 98 seats to the opposition 65. To be sure, there were many sort. There were many different distortions throughout the country. There were some states in which the opposition benefited from this change, the proportional representation system, but that was the final balance. The CNE that is overseeing this process, the electoral management body, the, the Consejo Nacional Electoral, uh, does still have the same political split as before, four to one, as as David mentioned. Um, the president and the vice president of the CNE are repeating in their second seven-year terms though many argued that they should not have been allowed to run this time. Uh, the selection of the CNE's board, uh, which was supposed to take place through Congress but ended up being named by the Supreme Court, did not generate, I think, a more optimism about the electoral system from the perspective of the, the opposition. Uh, an October 2014 poll uh, commissioned by the Catholic University of Andres Bello in Caracas and carried out by a polling firm found that 56% of the population lacked confianza or trust in the CNE. Uh, it bears mentioning that the CNE uh, ranked second to the National uh, Armed Forces and just uh, uh, above the Army, pardon me, just above the government and the National Assembly. Um, so this polling data reflects the growing concerns about deteriorating, deteriorating electoral quality in Venezuela. Most recently, the changes in quality have been picked up by the Project for Electoral Integrity which is a global survey of electoral, um, of elections run by uh, uh, experts where they survey experts from the world, or pardon me, um, they survey experts um, abroad and in country to get a perception similar to what uh, Transparency International does to get an overall sense of the quality um, of those elections. And they call this their global index of electoral integrity. Venezuela's 2012 election fell into the mid-level category and the 2013 dropped to the low quality category. Uh, a careful review of the 2012 and 2013 election study missions written by the Carter Center reveals uh, or tracks out similarly with this sort of deterioration in the quality. In other words, the negative trend seems to be noted by many different agencies. I'm not, unfortunately, optimistic about the quality of this election improving. The campaign has not even begun, and that is the period where I feel we will see the real problems 
in the changing media landscape in Venezuela, um, where there are, I think, very serious restrictions on freedom of expression. Anyway, so key numbers to remember when the elections are announced, when the dates come, 83, 99, 110. 83 is what you need to be a simple majority, 99 is what you need for a three-fifths majority, and 110 is what you need for two-thirds majority. The opposition. Who is the opposition? What is the opposition? This is a very difficult question, in fact. Um, it's a coalition of ideologically diverse parties loosely organized under the Democratic Unity Table at the moment. This is, Unity Table is called the MUD, M-U-D. Now, thinking about the MUD's work right now and the state of play in the opposition, if I had to, you know, conjure up one image of, of the state of play, I would imagine a cartoon showing a picture of the MUD's office door, and on the front door there would be a big sticker reading, Under Construction. So the question that opposition supporters would be saying, is this finished product coming soon? Are we going to see a finished product from this construction? And what is it going to infect be? I think there are four questions to try and think through what may emerge from this construction zone. One, will there be a reemergence of La Salida from last year, the proposal promoted by Leopoldo Lopez and others um, that, that has this double meaning, right, of being the exit as well as meaning the way out of this problem? So will we have La Salida 2.0? Second, will the opposition prioritize parliamentary elections? Three, will the opposition transition from being in a state of disarray, which it is currently, to getting organized and becoming genuinely united? Four, if the opposition does become united, does it have the bandwidth to do both? That is, does it have the bandwidth to do street demonstrations and to campaign? Those are the four questions that I think are out there. Okay, going back a little bit to 2014. After La Salida, the opposition stood together, but cr precariously, as a house divided. The two heads of the family were in a heated disagreement, but there was a mediator in place to reconcile differences. The two heads of the divided family were, on the one hand, Leopoldo Lopez, who despite being jailed, I would argue, effectively changed the game of Venezuelan politics by spearheading the confrontational protest movement that involved disruptive, uh, peaceful and violent forms of street demonstrations, and then the other side stood Enrique Capillas, the opposition's 2012 and 2013 presidential candidate, and still a governor of the important state of Miranda. But the important, the important part was that in between Capillas and Leopoldo Lopez stood the executive secretary, executive secretary of the MUD, Ramon Guillermo Avaledo. He is now no, no, no longer there. And this makes these relationships very rough and very difficult to manage, I would argue, at the moment. The, his successor at the mood, uh, uh, Chuo Toralba, is a man who comes from a background of street mobilization and, and working with popular sector actors. And so he has an interesting profile, but he doesn't really have the punch and the power of a true negotiator who's able to really um, you know, have that extensive Rolodex to, to get into these problems and be able to solve them. He doesn't have that power. Um, another important consequence, you know, we know that Lopez has been in jail and that this has, you know, created a number of problems for within the opposition, but it's also important to realize that from all this, Enrique Capriles emerged weakened, significantly weakened. All along, Capriles tied his leadership to the idea of uniting all Venezuelans, of reconciling Chavismo and the opposition. Now, if the opposition is not even in, united, Capriles' message is very muddled. Okay, so let's think through 2015. And first, it's important to remember what worked, I think, for the opposition in 2010, or where it came from, at least, in terms of having a successful outcome in those elections. First, it's important to remember that 2005 to 2010, the opposition was absent from the National Assembly. It boycotted those 2005 elections. So we don't really have a template in terms of, you know, talking about what was really, really successful, because in 2010, the opposition was coming from a position of nothing, right? It was building for the for the first time a place in the National Assembly. So it, it's a very different moment. It's not building momentum, it's trying to consolidate what it's had before and try and deal with these different problems that it's accumulated over time of becoming a real national force, I would argue. So at, in 2010, it was clear the opposition party showed real signs of coordination, a significant level of consensus or policy agreement, and most importantly, they agreed upon a plan of action. In short, they looked like they meant business, and this boosted their image significantly. Arguably, it was the opposition's high watermark, or at least one of them, but 2015 looks to be a very different moment, in large part because of the divisions that emerged last year. But also because opposition representatives who were in the National Assembly from 2010 to 2015 didn't really do very much. 
At the same time, the opposition has three governors. Those governors don't really have a coordinated plan of action. They don't work uh, in lock, stop, and barrel together. Um, and, and, and it's not clear what program they're promoting. If there were three specific initiatives that all three governors were working on, that people would be able to, to some extent, understand what the opposition proposes. Now, I know the counter-argument here is that, okay, the mood is an electoral alliance, it's not a political party, so it makes sense for there to be pluralism. Okay, great, everyone loves pluralism, but no one here is asking for the opposition to all wear the same shirts, to all think the same way, to all wear the same hats. They're simply saying that the, the opposition faces this major challenge of being a coalition. It needs to act together in a coordinated fashion. This is the challenge that always, that all opposition, pardon me, that all coalitions face. Um, one political analyst complained to me, um, and after talking with some members of the opposition and, and political parties, that he said that political parties, and I quote, were in a mode of navel gazing, rather than doing everything possible in their power to let ordinary Venezuelans know that they, these political party members, relate to the social problems going on in the country and that they have an ally in the opposition. So with the opposition bogged down by internal strife, they're expending resources to try and get on the same page, and thus far, they are very far behind, uh, I think, the, uh, the government in terms of, of being organized and ready for election day. Um, I know the polls say they have a golden opportunity, but I'm a bit, du bit dubious of the idea that Enrique Kraus suggested in the New York Times last week. Just because Maduro has 22% approval rating, that that means the opposition is necessarily going to capitalize. So, scenarios going forward. Um, returning to my, my four questions from the beginning. No, I do not think La Salida 2.0 is going to reemerge. Um, I think we will continue to see pop-up protests in response to arbitrary moves by the country's deeply flawed justice system, um, you know, like we've seen recently. Um, but the state security apparatus, in which I would include the activities of irregular armed groups, seems ready and able to repress these protests. Um, the possibility of a broader flaring up of demonstrations if the government makes a major mistake, I think, though, is possible. But it would, it would be a surprise, I think, to me if we saw a new cycle of major demonstrations like last year, especially those promoted by the opposition. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so will the opposition prioritize elections? Yes, I, I think they will. But I fear they will do so lacking a fully integrated opposition political <coughs> movement. Now, the fourth question. Given the trade-offs of trying to do both at the same time, of trying to pro promote protests and also campaign, I think they're most likely going to be spending their time doing um, the election campaigning. Um, I do not envy their very big time challenge, um, but there are no quick and easy solutions to this problem. There are no quick wins in this game. Uh, this is a very difficult situation in Venezuela, but the opposition has to play ball by the rules if they want to win and win with integrity. So last, on the international front, um, I think there are four important things to think about here. Um, post the thaw in U.S.-Cuban relations, Venezuela is fighting for relevance in this town and throughout the hemisphere, I would argue. Um, some people have suggested that Venezuela could in some way factor into U.S.-Cuban relations, either by becoming an irritant to those relations or the possibility of a thaw, or, in fact, by, by in the way that the Cubans would want to put the issue on the table. I don't think that the U.S.-Cuban relation, or pardon me, the U.S.-Cuban negotiations are anywhere near a point where you could see Venezuela somehow entering that agenda. But I don't think it's a completely, um, 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 you know, I, I don't think it can be discounted as a long-term possibility if the U.S.-Cuba front uh, continues to show progress. You know, we'll see what happens, you know, starting Friday here in town. Venezuela and China. Maduro took a long multi-stop trip in early January. He said he got $20 billion in investment from China. We have no evidence so far that this has in fact taken place. I'm not saying it won't happen, but I've asked for evidence of what form this is going to come from, from the Chinese government, from Chinese banks, from Chinese private capital, whatever. We have nothing so far, and it's already the end, getting to the end of February. It could happen, but you know, we, we don't know yet. U.S.-Venezuela relations. Um, from the embassy here in town, and when you talk to people at the foreign ministry, what they say, what they said coming into this, was they wanted to have a really positive relationship, or pardon me, a really positive meeting at the Summer of the Americas between the U.S. and Venezuela at the meeting in April. Um, shortly after that, I remember seeing Maduro uh, accuse Vice President Biden of being directly implicated in a coup effort. I, I don't get it. I, I, I really don't see how those two things align. 
Um, the claims of a coup seem desperate, and there's no real evidence presented so far, like David mentioned. Could more sanctions happen from the U.S. government? Yes, I think, unfortunately, they could. The White House spokesperson's comment that the Obama administration is considering, quote, additional tools that can help steer Venezuela in a more positive direction did not go over very well. Uh, sectors of the Venezuelan opposition reject co such comments as well. Um, and for, you know, for the Maduro government, this plays right into their narrative. It fits the argument that the United States is judgmental and meddlesome. But I think the key is our, our reactions from new voices. And I'll, I'll, I won't say much about UNASOR because David made some useful comments about that. But by new voices, what do I mean? I saw on February 19th, Bill Clinton posted on Twitter that Leopoldo Lopez and all political prisoners should be released without delay. The Inter-American Human Rights Commission, I think today or yesterday, part of the OAS, expressed profound concern regarding the rule of law in Venezuela. And there are also new voices on the left criticizing this government. Uh, Isabel Allende, the politician, the president of the Senate in Chile, daughter of Salvador Allende, uh, an influential member of the Socialist Party in Chile, called for the, quote, government of Chile um, should, you know, make its concern uh, known for the detention of, of, of Metropolitan Mayor of Caracas, Antonio Ledesma. And also Juan Pablo Letelier, the son of Orlando Letelier, echoed the same sentiments on Twitter. These are important developments, um, and I have to say that I see the Venezuelan government losing ground in terms of its international standing, and this could eventually hurt its leverage. I'll close there. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, David. Uh, I want to open for questions now. I'm <coughs> going to ask um, when you're recognized to um, speak loudly, say who you are, and, then, and try to be brief. I'll just put one question on the table or, or really comment. It seems to me from what you both said that both for the government and for the opposition, um, as uneven as the electoral playing field is likely to be, going to elections and having legitimate elections looks like a key agenda item for both sides. Of course, winning those elections would be ultimately <laughs> the name of the game. But getting to those elections, having them legitimate, having the outcome legitimate from either side what they stand for seems key, and that seems like something to work with for the international community as well. Uh, this government has always prided itself, and I think with, with some large justification, that it is a legitimately elected government. That doesn't mean that everything it does is correct, but it has that legitimacy, and I think that has been a wellspring for it, and it doesn't want to lose that. So that on the government side and on the opposition side, since it has taken itself out of the game before to disastrous effect, not just for them, but you could argue for the country, to, to stay in the game, especially when it might have a shot at winning. Those seem really, um, coming at it from different sides, important aspects of the strategy um, to take a look at. So I do, I wanted to leave that to both of you to comment on as part of questions, but I also want to now recognize our audience. Um, yes. Hi, Jose de Vastos, I'm a Venezuelan journalist. Uh, my question would be, what would happen in a, I think, today possible scenario that the elections happen, the opposition focuses on the elections and reaches something nearby 60% of the popular vote, but still Chavismo gets more Congress members, which is something possible because of this 13. And, uh, like you would maintain a legitimacy, the government outside because the elections happen, the opposition went to the elections, put its uh, hope in it, but still the result is, despite a landslide victory in popular vote, they get less Congress. What would be, what do you think would be the scenario after such a, an event? Well, if I don't see another hand go up right away, we'll go right to that question. Right, we have a question here, and then we'll, we'll go back to our speakers. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Juan Niesle. Um I was wondering, uh, Michael briefly mentioned the um, socialist type, which is, you know, Maria Socialista, he's the, it's the um, group that is dissenting from Chavismo. But on the opposition, there's also, um, on my most recent trip to Venezuela, you see also a dissidence movement um, that also has a characteristic that also comes from the left side of the political spectrum. So my question would be, what is the future short-term and long-run um, expectations that both, both of those dissident movements might be able to break the, um, I guess, a two-block political system in Venezuela? Sure, I think we can see each uh, respond to these questions. The, um, the, you know, as far as the, as far as that scenario, uh, you know, a version of that actually happened already in 2010, in the sense that 
the mood got more votes than the PSU. Is that right? No, no it, it, it got less. It, it, but the 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 PSU got fewer votes than the mood and the third party candidates. Yet they right. got the majority of the seats. And so, in theory, the same thing could happen this time. They could get 52, 53 percent of the votes, and you know, and uh, I'm still have the minority in the. the the legislature. Now, I think and Mike might know these numbers a little bit better than I do. What I've heard is that that works up to about 55 percent. If the opposition were to get 55 percent or more, well, then they would win the the national assembly. They would take over. If they were to get, you know, you know, uh, gerrymandering wherever it's used always has. There's always a threat of a backfire because the way it works is it, it takes big districts with big majorities and flattens those majorities to spread out those votes in other districts. So it works if you have a majority, but if, if you lose big, you lose really big. So my understanding is that anything over 60% would be an absolute disaster for the government. They would really lose uh, a, a very big majority, a disproportionate majority in, in the National Assembly. But if they were in that range of 52, 53%, you know, I mean, I think that's a conceptual problem for the government. You know, it, it makes it look like uh, the system is rigged in their favor. But, I, you know, I don't really think that that's a really huge damning problem that's going to undermine its legitimacy. I mean, just ask George Bush. He won the 2000 elections with, you know, without winning the popular vote. So it definitely happens in any system that's not just straightforward popular vote. That, 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 that's a logical possibility. As far as uh, your question, you know, I think um, in terms of... Um, you know, on either side uh, of movements peeling away, you know, it, of course there's always going to be movements like Maria Socialista uh, and, uh, and, and other um, uh, movements that, that, that peel away. You know, it's important to remember that Venezuela, is, that Michael was mentioning the, the reform of the electoral law that, that pushed it from a predominantly proportional representation to uh, uninominal. <coughs> Uh, representation and that that favors sort of bipartisanship or it favors you know uh, um, um, what would you what would you call it you know uh, um, two party. Two, a two-party system you no know? so I think there's there's strong incentives against that that didn't exist uh, a few years back you know at this point still Chavismo is you know, it's pretty strong. It's the strongest, in terms of party, it's the strongest party in, in the system right now. And so it's a little hard to, to think of, of space for sort of pro-government uh, movements having a real impact. In the opposition, actually, the problem is, is, is exactly that. It's too divided. There's, there's all kinds of parties. You know, there's not any one party that brings together enough people so they have this huge problem uh, with coordination. The 60% um, popular uh, vote scenario, first of all, for the opposition would be uh, a great success, right? I mean, that's what matters most, right? If they were to get 60% of the vote, popular vote, that would be um, a major achievement. Um, and other things that I could think about in terms of, of what it would do within the opposition, it could theoretically uh, strengthen uh, the pro or strongly pro-election wing of the opposition, you could argue. Um, but at the same time, if it were to produce, uh, you know, the, you know, representation problem within the, within the Congress, it wouldn't necessarily quiet the other wing, right? Because their point would be, what's the point of participating, right? So I see that as a kind of real nightmare scenario in a number of ways. Um, we haven't seen, you know, the districts yet, so we don't know, like David said, um, whether or not that's an actual empirical possibility in terms of you know, 60% popularity, but but not you know even close to 50% uh, you know representation in the Congress. Um, but but it's an interesting thing to think about. You know, uh, Franz van Bergen's been doing some reporting from El Nacional that talks about different scenarios along those lines and stuff like that. Um, your specific question, uh, I would um, just echo what David said. Um, specifically, I think the best piece written about this issue from the left is a piece by Edgardo Landed, which is available on the internet called Quien ganó las elecciones de 2010, um, and he talks about how uh, the diminishing of proportional representation has always hurt the left, and that it goes against the spirit of, of most of what Chavismo believed when it was not in power. Um, and uh, as far as you know, socialist tide, I'm not sure they're at a point where they're going to fully peel away from um, the pro-government coalition. 
but I think they're now beginning, you know, to, to you know, as it were, uh, uh, you know, you know, talk to the opposition a little bit, right? I mean, it, it's a different, it's a different game right now. I think for those people in socialist tide, they have surprisingly good media presence, and that that makes them seem a little bit more popular than they perhaps are in terms of popular support. Do you have a question right here in front. Hi, uh, my name is Ramon Sanko, I'm a reporter with uh, AFP. Uh, I have a couple uh, one, two questions. Uh, one for, for David. Uh, you mentioned that UNESCO is a club of, of countries and they don't really want to you know, um, get the, their hands dirty in Venezuela, the situation is very complex. Uh, do you see that as a, an incentive for Maduro to, to maybe build this or continue this crackdown against opposition and uh, repression and uh, public uh, demonstrations. And um, uh, Michael, um, do you see any, any difference in, in the response that the region has given to the situation in Venezuela comparing with um, other, other, other regions, I mean, other organizations like the region, uh, European Union, for example, that was very criticized very harshly the, the, very harshly the, the arrest of uh, Mm -hmm. And also, do you see a difference between how the, the region responds last year to the situation, the demonstrations, and, and now? Just three questions. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead and go Michael first. Michael, do you want to go? Sure. Um, what exactly did the European Union say? And was it definitely the European Union, not like the Euro Comoro or something like that? Like, was it definitely the no, European no. Union? Because uh, there are many uh, different multilateral yeah, well, European I, I, sorry, bodies, yeah, think, so it's, it's it sometimes an alphabet super. Human, really. human rights uh, representation. Um, representation of the okay, well that's different than the yeah, than a regional yeah, body, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so that's an important yeah, distinction. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, I, I think that that you know to go to the root of the matter, I think uh, I do sense um, a bit of a change in terms of responses throughout. Uh, Western Hemisphere. I'll, I'll stick to that. That's what I. That's more more or less what I follow carefully, and and I think that you know, sure. I mean, okay. So if I'm sitting at you know the foreign ministry and I have to write another press statement in 2014, I said we're worried. This year I'm going to say we're really worried, right? You know, you're going to add gran you know, right? Something, something to make it seem a little bit different. But I think there is something actually to that. I think that Brazil is. Um, losing its patience with the situation to a certain extent. Um, you have a different foreign minister in Brazil. That foreign minister was the former Brazilian ambassador here in Washington. Uh, I'm not sure he sees the situation the same way as those did before. Um, you know, Lula is still an important back channel, I think some people argue, with the Venezuela-Brazil and the broader Brazil-U.S. relationship. Um, and, but we haven't heard anything from him from some time. But I think the, the bigger issue here, again, is, you know, Colombia has made, you know, um, louder statements about, you know, Lopez and other uh, opposition members have been jailed, and I think that that really people just um, don't want to support or don't want to appear to be on the wrong side of a situation in which you have arbitrary detentions of elected leaders. That's something that's a major, you know, line that that that, that no one really wants to be seen as supporting in some ways. Um, and, you know, Samper is is a sort of you know Adam can tell us more about Samper than anyone else here. But you know, Samper is a peculiar choice for Unasor for a lot of reasons. But he doesn't have a very good relationship with the United States. He doesn't even have a visa, as far as I understand. So I mean, it, I don't understand this you know request from Maduro to have Unasor mediate the process. It doesn't really make any sense between the U.S. and Venezuela, considering Samper's troublesome history with the United States. Um, so so I mean, I think there are changing. I think the level of patience is really what it comes down to, um, and uh, I think that's really changing. Uh, what that could amount to in terms of, you know, of, you know, formal actions or official actions by these organizations is yet, you know, it, it's I'm I'm not quite sure what those could be. But you know, I saw in Sulsa say I think today or yesterday that he's calling for an inclusive discussion between the government and the opposition, not just talks, right? And the obvious, you know addition of inclusion is to say, look, it, it, it wasn't a good enough, you know, set of talks last year. We, the opposition didn't feel included in the way um, in which it could, you know, feel comfortable to negotiate it on, on different issues. Um, and, you know, I don't know what it means that Bill Clinton posted on his Twitter, what he posted on his Twitter, but it struck me as, you know, something relevant in some ways. I mean, he's an important person in terms of contacting, you know, 
international leaders all over the world, so I, I think it's relevant. Um, to answer your question, the, you know, you asked if uh, UNASUR's inaction is an incentive for Maduro, um, you know, to engage in these repressive activities. I, I think, I think it, it, the statement should be flipped around a little bit. I think Maduro's incentives are local. Maduro has a very big problem. You know, he has a huge economic problem. His, his government is not popular, and I think that's what explains uh, some of these repressive moves. You know, what's what's happening is that UNASUR has not been able to constrain Venezuela on these counts. You no, know? uh, if you think about it, UNASUR is you know started as a regional body. Its main focus has been regional autonomy and uh, the sovereignty of member states, and so. But, you know, that's always going to be its focus. Nevertheless, there is a real interest. There's an interest in human rights, and there's budding sort of human rights uh, 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 um, efforts within UNASUR that will take some time. But there's there's interest. And there's also interest in, in things not deteriorating as well. I mean, Colombia and Brazil have huge economic interests and huge commercial interests. Venezuela. The entire region, the left governments in the region have a very big interest in Venezuela not uh, deteriorating, as do all of the countries. You know? It would be a real black eye of Unas work if things really get out of hand in Venezuela. So they, they do have an interest in, in uh, uh, what's going on in Venezuela. But they were born in their primar primary emphasis in regional autonomy and state sovereignty. And so when the U.S. puts forward sanctions, you know, their default reaction is going to be to circle the wagons. That's that's their top priority. And so anytime that happens, and it's going to continue happening, because there's going to be there's more uh, uh, sanctions and measures in the works, I think it really impedes UNASUR's incipient efforts at trying to uh, uh, mediate and have some sort of constructive impact in Venezuela. Thank you. Do we have any other show of hands? Questions? We still have about 10 minutes by my clock if there are any other questions. Oh, if I may I follow up, but that's, isn't, that, isn't that an incentive? If, 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 if I say the, um, the economic situation is, is what has triggered maybe uh, the, the protests and, and, uh, and also the, the repression, and, and UNASUR hasn't been able to restrain them as well on that, isn't that a message sent to Maduro also that? No, I mean, if you get in trouble, you can continue to do it. I, I, I mean, I think in the end, it's just how you use those terms. I don't say it's an incentive. I think it's a lack of disincentive. I, mean, okay. I think the incentives are, are, are the, the incentive for any government at any time to, you know, abuse human rights. It's overdetermined. Of course, people in power always want to stay in power, you know, and they're usually going to do whatever they can unless some kind of institution is constrained. In this case, UNASUR, I think, and, and these regional institutions are, are uh, you know, have that potential, but that potential is not being exercised partly, you know, by their own fault, and, and also now it's being complicated by U.S. sanctions that is getting them to focus on other things, such as, you know, uh, regional autonomy and state sovereignty. Yeah, we had Adam, and then we'll go back. Um, I guess, uh, following up on that same theme, I mean, since Ledesma was arrested, I've lost count of how many commentators, mostly U.S. commentators, I've read saying, really condemning almost, Brazil and Mexico, the two largest countries in Latin America, for their silence. Um, not just UNASUR, they, they, people don't talk about that framework very much, because I, I, I mean, there was some disappointment in some of some pairs comments, but the bigger countries, and to a lesser extent Colombia, although we understand that what, how Colombia might be constrained. How do you view the foreign policy? You talked a little bit about, about Brazil. I mean, but especially at this very moment, what are the incentives or the reasons they're facing for their stance or lack of it? And if you have time, I'd also just like your sense of who is the coalition? Who's the Chavistas? Who are the Chavistas right now? Um, you've got this paralysis on inability to make decisions on reforms or anything else. Is that because of unanimity about the status quo, or is that because of deep divisions that are just canceling everybody out? We're going to add your question and then we'll come back so we don't run out of time. Okay, um, I want to ask what is the uh, position and influence of Diogo Cabello in this regard since we haven't spoken about him in this meeting so far? Considering the recent allegations from a foreign bodyguard of his that he's the head of the biggest 
um, drug cartel in Venezuela, but beyond that, many people in Venezuela actually see him as the one with the real power in Venezuela, even more over, Ma over Maduro. Great, that's a lot to respond to. <laughs> okay, um, okay. The, uh, you know, Ledesma, a U.S. commentator from condemning Brazil and Mexico. You know, I, I, I'm going to say a couple contradictory things here. The, um, you know, I can sympathize with that. I, I think, you know, I, and I get frustrated that regional allies don't, or, you know, regional powers don't say more, you know, and I think if they did that, well, then that would, uh, you know, the, uh, that, that would prevent the U.S. from acting as much as it does, you know, and, and in fact, last year when, you know, the sanctions talk started in May, uh, but, you know, there was this, this dialogue that was going on, and, and that sort of effectively quelled that for a while, made it much more difficult. Once that dialogue was over, and Unasur was actually saying, oh, that was great, that, that you know, stopped the violence, there was no sign that that was going to start again, well, then it made it much more difficult to say, don't intervene, you know. And so I, I get some, uh, you know, I can share some of that frustration. However, you know, condemning Brazil and Mexico for their lack of, of statements, you know, I mean, I just, I think uh, that's easy to say, you know, I just think that there's other, you know, there's a number of other gorillas in the room, or elephants in the room, you know, I think the U.S., you know, U.S.'s role in, in Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, you know, I mean, so, yeah, I don't remember Brazil and Mexico criticizing the U.S. about that either, you know, and so, uh, you know, I just I just think sometimes, especially in this town, there's there's this incredible myopia about who says what about which country, and this in this this sort of moral high horse about you know the cases that Washington takes on and the cases that it looks past, and so I take that uh, with with a grain of salt, you know, condemning Brazil and Mexico about this, but I think in a, stepping back in a sociological sense, I think. It's important to think about that. This regional unity is important. You know, it, it's it, it not so much important. It's robust. You know, and to think about the fact that it's Selah, you know, Mexico, Panama, Colombia, all these U.S. allies, you know, supported um, these uh, uh, you know this unanimous uh, condemnation. U.S. sanctions. I mean, I think that is just something that's got to register in this town, you know, uh, about the, the new sort of atmosphere. Um, as far as who the Chavistas are right now, uh, and, and sort of the paralysis, I mean, I, I think that's a good question. You know, you just don't see anymore. You're just, you're really enthusiastic, average Chavista. You know, most people that are, are still really on board are really ideologically committed or they work in the government, or they're part of a movement, you know, um, you just, you don't see the enthusiasm that you once did, I mean, they only had 20% support, you know, even people that I know that work in the government, the ones that are still working in the government, a lot of them have left to do other things, the ones that are still working in the government are just kind of, blah, well, this is the best job I have, has benefits, you know, there's just not that enthusiasm. I think the paralysis you see is, uh, in large part, I think, <clears throat> you know, comes from the top. The Maduro does not have uh, the the sort of leadership that can that he can listen to some movements and ministers and whatnot and say, okay, we're going to do this, and now all of you are going to fall in line. That's what Chavez did, you know. So there were differences of opinion with Chavez, and Chavez would say, we're going to do this, and now we're going to fall in line. Maduro just doesn't really have that. So you, you, there's a lot of people that feel like they don't really have a boss and just have their own agendas and do whatever they want. Um, as far as the, the position and influence of Dios del Cabello. No, that, that sort of dips into criminology. It's really difficult to you know uh, what, what is going on. You know, I, I think, uh, I'm not a big Dios del Cabello fan. I think, you know, the, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan. Nevertheless, you know, the, the statements that came out from, I've never discussed this with a few journalists, specialists in, in this area, that were published by ABC, by Liam C. Uh, from Salazar. It, it, to me, they're, they just seem too incredible to be true. You know, the idea that Diosdado at this point in time, uh, you know, that he was the head or a head of the cartel of the Solis, and I, I, I tried to do some research, I never saw any accusations of that 
talked about it before. You see all kinds of accusations about corruption, about you know money uh, exchange. You know, you, you can listen to the Mario Silva tape from May of 2013, and he extensively talks about the thousand involvement in, in different sort of exchange uh, corruption. But nobody has talked about it. Suddenly, this guy comes and says he's the head of the Cartel de los Soles, in that he's involved in a very concrete way, and nobody knew about it. it just seems too incredible. I mean, I think, you know, you can imagine maybe him winking at it or something like that. But, I, you know, I think those accusations have to be taken uh, with a grain of salt. You know, as far as who has the real power in Venezuela, Dios clearly has a lot of power in Venezuela, more than any National Assembly president has probably ever had in, in the history. Our people that are in the inside uh, suggest that Maduro actually does have the power right now. He actually is setting the agenda. And he has progressively marginalized dissenting voices you know, over the past two years and, and has, has developed a, a pretty good grip. Clearly, he is now, and Cabello is right there. It's more sort of a committee type structure and has, has a huge voice. But, you know, the, uh, the, the idea uh, that he's really in control behind, I think, you know, feeds into a lot of sort of uh, conspiracy theories from, from you know, the opposite direction, from the opposition. And, and he's a great bad guy. And uh, so, you know, I take this with a little bit of grain of salt. Clearly he's very powerful. You know, he's one of the number of powerful figures in the government. A great question, Adam. I, I think the, um, the, the, the conundrum of, you know, sort of <clears throat> South American foreign policy toward itself Right, <laughs> you know what is that? We don't we don't really know yet what what its policies are toward its neighbors, right? Amongst neighbors, right? And and I guess you know I was trying to think about the right metaphor. You know, it seems to me that you know you could liken the situation to one of you know where you're getting together with a bunch of new business partners, right? And you know you have this baseline of consensus about what you're trying to do in working together as a team. Um, and so therefore there are a bunch of taboos, right? And those taboos are, you know, some of these issues that we're talking about, right? You don't talk about the bad things that happen in my state. I don't talk about the bad things that happen in your state. You know, um, you know, Mexico wasn't very happy when, when Mujica said that Mexico looked like a, a failed state after, you know, the, the mass, the, the, the very tragic death of 43 students, which, you know, most people are calling a massacre. Um, so, you know, these things are, are very, very delicate. And, my sense is that a region that knows how bad uh, the human rights situation uh, is in its own countries doesn't want to start a process of beginning to each accuse each other of having gigantic human rights problems. And so that alternative, that, that scary alternative of things going in that direction where, you know, tit for tat about human rights problems here and there, um, it is, 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 is so ugly, such an ugly alternative that, you know, just kind of have to, you know, hold to these taboos, and and that's very difficult to swallow, you know, for the reasons that David mentioned. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to note that many of the commentators who criticize, you know, Brazil and Mexico's uh, lack of, you know, you know, uh, moral, uh, you know, sense of uh, outrage about these issues, you know, they're kind of playing the double game, right? They want this to become a more and more international issue, right? They're trying by talking about these things to make the point that more international players need to be involved with them as well. So even by condemning these things, they're, they're somehow trying to attract, I think, more international interest to the issue. Um, just very quickly, I mean, I don't know if Mexico really has a foreign policy except for trade, right, and its relationship with the United States, which has dominated so much of its foreign affairs for some time. You know, Rafael Fernandez de Castro has a new piece in America's Quarterly saying, does Mexico now, be, is it beginning to have a foreign policy that's actually relevant beyond these you know, historical issues? Maybe, but it's just beginning, right? It's going to take a very long time for it to develop. And Brazil is not a global power yet. Brazil is not in a position where it can criticize other countries' human rights problems and still get what it wants, right? It's not in that position, right? It, 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 or at least it does, I don't think it sees itself there yet, right? It's an emerging global power. It has those aspirations. Um, but, you know, that's the basic theory about, you know, why the U.S. can do it, right? They can get away with it because they have power or something. Brazil isn't there. So that's one explanation to a certain extent about, about the Brazil part. Um, and, you know, who is Chavismo today? You know, it, it's, it's really not clear. Um, you know, I think you have, you know, a lot of support from um, the, the military base and, and uh, associated institutions of those who work for the state. Um, but I'm not really sure 
um, what's going to happen in these elections in terms of whether or not people are going to turn out to vote or not. I mean, I think that's going to be the big indicator. I'm not predicting a major shift in terms of tons of Chavistas going to opposition um, parties and voting for the for, the, for mood supported candidates. I don't think that's very likely at this point. But but I but I think that you know we're going to potentially see a major um, reshuffling of this constituency or pardon me of this coalition in some ways. Um, and on Diosdado, I mean, you know, I. I really don't think that that is the key issue at the moment, I would say. Um, you know, I, I think that the big problem is whether or not, um, you know, Maduro continues on this radical line and whether or not that produces a situation in which he can somehow consolidate support behind him, then take a risky political decision or economic reform decision, such as you know unifying the exchange rates, which some people argue is not likely to happen, but others think could still happen next year or later this year, um, or doing something like uh, raising the price of gasoline, which you know David mentioned in his remarks, something that would give Maduro some kind of daylight between Chavismo and Chavez's legacy and what Maduro accomplished would be the best way, I think, for Maduro to somehow say, look, this is my government, and Diosdado is an important member of it, but this is clearly my show, and, and stuff like that. And and we haven't seen that yet, I don't know. So I think, you know, that your question is relevant, but I don't think Diosdado is the key person to watch right now in that regard. Great. Um, we're, we're at time, but I wanted to return to one question and then give both of our, our speakers a, a last chance at summarizing it. And this question of um, it's come up in different ways that this sort of healthy interest in inst institutionality, at least with respect to elections, on both sides of the fray, both in terms of the, the government and its narrative over years, and in terms of the opposition, is seeing perhaps having a golden opportunity to actually gain some ground in elected positions. So, uh, on the one hand, you, this is, wasn't in the cards in Venezuela. The government has no opposition with which to sort of share the pain of the economic reforms now that it needs to institute. It, it, the, the opposition is not at the table. The opposition cannot, you know, take responsibility for this. The government has to take that on. What would happen? This because this is a possible scenario. If the, the opposition does make gains, does have a real stronghold in the national assembly, and the the government uh, needs to uh, move forward in somehow in negotiation with the opposition as part of institutionality. And, it, and as far as I'm concerned, it, it's, it would be a unique development since Chavez came to power to have that. And without making any clear parallels, there are cases where losing elections uh, in the Congress, in the National Assembly, can be liberating to the executive to do things that he or she may have wanted to do. Um, so I, just if you have any comments on that, and then any last comments, and then we'll wrap up. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to reiterate the importance of, you know, this election uh, for Venezuela staying on one side of the ledger in terms of being an electoral democracy. I think, um, you know, if, if, the, if the quality of this electoral process takes another major step down, we're going to be in new and very, very troublesome territory going forward for Venezuelan politics, I think. Um, and I think the opposition so far, um, it, most of the moderate voices and even some of the radicals want to participate in this electoral process. And I think that at the moment, um, the sort of the part of the opposition that is of the idea that they need to not only construct a, a, a solid majority to sort of see through some kind of future coming to power, but also that they need to participate um, with integrity in some ways. I, I think that seems to be the message that I'm getting from some parts um, of the opposition. There are others um, who, you know, want to do both things at the same time. They want to be involved in street protests and fomenting unrest, and they also want to participate because they want to get into the National Assembly and have a post. So, so that's 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 a very tricky question. Um, now, if the opposition were to, you know, win a majority in terms not only of popular vote, but in terms of representation, I think the key issues that they're going to want to look at are uh, reforming the electoral system to some extent, uh, and specifically the way the, the CNE works, and I think also the main issue there is judges. Uh, they want to change the justice system, they want to be able to name 
um, uh, or revisit some of the people that have been appointed to many of these posts. Um, there are other institutions that would also perhaps be in play, such as the Attorney General's Office um, and, and the Ombudsman and, and related offices like that, the Comptroller General who's in charge of investigating corruption and, and barring people from running for political office. All those sorts of things are the key beginning issues, and then I think the opposition also would propose an amnesty law for um, those who are in exile and abroad here in the United States and elsewhere and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, my final comment is that, you know, it's really early in 2015 in Venezuelan politics. Um, so things are really just beginning, as it turns out, uh, not only in terms of the calendar year, but I think that, you know, a lot is still yet to be told of this story for this year. Um, and, you know, you don't really want to make predictions in Venezuelan politics because things change so quickly all the time. Um, but I'm hopeful that, you know, this electoral process can, can go some way, make some headway in terms of uh, tamping down radical voices on both sides. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I agree with, with those remarks. The, um, you know, I, I think these elections are absolutely key. This, this is, uh, uh, I think, 2015 is going to be a really key year in the history of Venezuelan democracy it's simply because it's, it's, it's going to be a year of crisis. The economic crisis is going to be very difficult and it's going to be a, a, a year of elections in which the government you know, could well face very serious setbacks at the polls. And so I think you know, it's a huge opportunity on the one hand for the opposition to uh, you know, gain more space in the government with which it can hold the executive in check and show itself to be relevant. Uh, it's also a huge opportunity for the government to to burnish its democratic credentials. I think there can be a lot of a lot of uh, criticisms. You know, I make a lot of these criticisms of of the government, but I think it's a legitimate government because I think that it has won elections and it's consistently gone to elections. No, it may, may be defective, but, but they've, they've won by, by good margin most of the time um, uh, in these elections. So I think it's key. It's one, one of the things that really distinguishes Chavismo from 20th century socialist experiences is not even really the ideology, but the fact that they've consistently gone to the urns. And, and I think it's, it's a real opportunity for them to, to reinforce their democratic credentials. You know, and I think part of this, as John suggested, that... Um, you know, doing this, you know, would actually allow them to share some of the burden, you know, of, of what's going on. Uh, you know, one of the big problems they have is they're facing a real, very serious problem, and they have no one to blame. They've been in power for 16 years, and they control all branches of the government. And so that's why you get these rather fantabulous uh, conspiracy theories, because um, they, they, they can't really blame the opposition, who has very little space in the government. So I, I think these elections are really key um, uh, to, uh, for the Venezuela conflict to maintain, to continue to be an institutional <coughs> conflict, you know, that the political conflict can stay with an institutional bond. I think this is going to be key. You know, in addition to the different issues that, that Michael mentioned, I, I also mentioned that you know, if the opposition were to take the National Assembly, I think one thing that would be on the agenda that could, could uh, would be transparency laws. I know that the, you know the, the, the opposition actually brought, put forward a transparency law, and we're considering a proposal uh, about a year or two ago. And, and there's a number of good proposals that are in the works that could immediately be brought to the floor, and that could be quite interesting as well. But to, not to end on uh, a somber note, but you know, if this year the opposition takes a national assembly, well, it, no matter what the case, next year at this time talk is going to be about a recall referendum. Whether the opposition takes us into the National Assembly or not. If they take the National Assembly, well then it's going to be easier for them. But uh, that whole, uh, uh, you know, that issue of a recall referendum is what caused the very serious conflict in 2002-2004. And that's in part because this is not clearly legislated, not clearly normed. Uh, it should be more now uh, since there was a, a recall referendum in 2004. But it's a very conflictive process. It has, it has to do with signatures that then have to be approved, and then there has to be a, 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 an actual recall uh, election, and so or an actual referendum. And so that could be a very conflictive process next year uh, uh, for us to be talking about. Well, that will have to be the last word today. Um, but uh, I want to thank uh, our speakers. Uh, I want to thank you, our audience, 
uh, here with us and also our, our audience via uh, live web stream. So thank you so much and stay tuned. We'll be following closely. Thank you.